Okay, welcome everybody. This is Magnolia United Church of Christ November Learning Forum. Oh, sorry, October. I'm in the wrong month. So all month, we have been celebrating our season of creation, and we're focusing on how we can each care for that small part of creation that we love. Tonight, we're going to do that by learning how to make backyards appealing to bees. Thank you to Bob Flack for this topic idea. Uh, our speaker tonight is Laura Matter. Laura is the program director of natural yard care at Tilt. Laura has been a practicing horticulturist for the past 40 years. She studied landscape horticulture at South Seattle Community College. She has an AA degree from Central Se Seattle Central Community College and a BA in botany from the University of Washington. Laura is currently the Natural Yard Care Program Director at Tilth Alliance. And in that position, she specializes in watershed health, pollinator gardening, and integrated pest management education. For tonight's presentation, Laura is going to talk for about 45 minutes, and then we're going to have time for questions. We're going to ask you to hold your questions till the end, but feel free to put them in chat as you feel called. And I am going to be managing the slide. So you'll hear Laura say next slide. That's me in the background doing that. I'm going to have everybody on mute during the presentation. So when we come to time for questions, I will go ahead and unmute folks or feel free to unmute yourself. OK, so turn it over to you, Laura. Great. There you go. All right. So tonight um, we're going to be talking about um, pollinator friendly gardening. We're going to start with looking who, at who are uh, the pollinators that we're talking about, um, which does heavily include bees. They are, of course, one of our main pollinators. And then we're going to talk about, and along the way, as we discuss different species, we'll also talk about how do you get them into your yard? How do you keep them there? How do you cater to them so that you have a um, healthy and friendly habitat for them? So next. All right, so here's a list, uh, pretty basic. We've got lots of different kinds of insects, bees and wasps, ants, beetles, moths and butterflies, even flies, um, birds and mammals, birds, bats, mice, humans, bear, rabbits, deer, squirrels. Some of these, of course, we know as sort of problematic residents in our gardens too. And, you know, we have um, issues with things like deer eating our plants and rabbits and squirrels stealing our crocus after we plant them things like that. But we're gonna look at each of these and, and what kind of function they play in the yard. So next. Right, so we look at this in terms of things that are biotic or abiotic. Abiotic just means that it's not an animal that's involved in the pollination. It could be wind blown. So there's a lot of trees that have catkins on them that hang in the spring in particular. If you think of things like birch trees, those are wind pollinated. And then hydrophily is just water assisted pollination. So these are aquatic plants where pollen is actually moving through water and, and getting to plants. But primarily we're gonna be talking about biotic. Um, mammal pollination is usually incidental. It's um, not always, um, or usually not about um, the pollen itself. It's about something else attractive about that plant, or it could be incidental where, you know, you're brushing against it and moving pollen around. With human beings, sometimes it's intentional where we actually are hand pollinating things. Uh, transfer of pollen by bats is tropical. We don't have that happen in the Northwest. It's really um, insect management that happens by bats in the Northwest. Uh, but in the tropic areas, some fruits are dependent on bats. So my, one of my favorites, mangoes, is one of those. Um, they tend to be drawn to white flowers. And um, in this area, you're not going to see this would be an also incidental pollination. So birds can do, be pollinators. Most of that is also incidental in the Northwest. Typically, it's a hummingbird that does the pollinating here. 
most of our birds are looking for fruit, seed, insects, um, but hummingbirds are looking for nectar. And so they do move pollen um, very purposefully. And then insects are really the big group. So those are the two groups we're gonna be looking at primarily. We'll talk about hummingbirds and we'll talk about all the different range of insects. Insects are a huge family of um, fauna in the garden and uh, there's all kinds of cool things that happen. There's a lot of co-evolution that has happened with flowers and insects um, pollinating. And typically flowers that insects are after are attractive and they're looking for both the nectar and the pollen. So next. So birds, as I said, um, we don't have very many birds that will be strictly pollinators in the Northwest. Most of these are also tropical, they're nectar feeding typically have these long bills and long tongues like you would expect from a hummingbird. And then many of them need a strong perch. Hummingbirds don't. They often are feeding, as I'm sure you've seen, sort of on the fly. And so we're <clears throat> only going to talk about hummingbirds tonight. So next. And the hummingbirds in the Northwest, we have four different species that could be here. We have Annas and Rufus, which are the most commonly seen. Um, Annas are year round now. They didn't used to be. So when I first started gardening, that wasn't a thing. Annas, hummingbirds were um, migrational and Rufus um, are as well. Rufus should be gone by now. The Annas are still around. In fact, I have a few little females that are feeding off the of autumn flower and clematis with little tiny bell-shaped flowers uh, out of my front um, yard. Um, that I can see from the window when I'm working on the computer, so that's sweet. The calliope and black chinned are very rare on the west side of Washington. You see them more on east on the east side, east of the mountains. Hummingbirds can be very territorial. Um, they love their flower patches. They know where they are. They come back um, again and again to areas where they know they can find nectar. Um, they again have those long bills, those really long tongues. They like tubular flowers and thin nectar. So flowers that will um, provide that for them are ideal. Um, they love red, orange, and yellow, but that's not exclusive. In fact, I have two very large rosemary plants on my parking strip. One of them has already started blooming. They usually bloom sporadically through the winter and then really pick up through the spring. So this is good food for this time of year when there aren't very many flowers around. And the, my hummingbirds go to that. Those are tiny, very pale blue flowers. And so that's not the norm that you would expect, but they love it. The way they move pollen is in the process of getting that nectar out, they've got their head down into the flower with their, their beak and their tongue down in the tube. And all of the pollen that's on the stamen of the flower gets deposited on the base of the bill and on their foreheads. And then they move along to the next flower and they're transferring that pollen, they're exchanging it. So next. All right, let's talk about the big group, the insects. So we've got moths and butterflies, beetles, flies, ants, wasps, and bees. And wasps, you know, people worry about, but they do good in the garden too. So next, all right, so moths and butterflies, these are kind of the, the beauty, beautiful ones of the insect world. People often, when they think about pollinator garden, think about butterflies, although these days bees have become very popular um, to learn about and to know about, which is really good. There's been a lot of issues with bee populations, honeybees, um, but also native bees. And we're going to break down the difference between them a little bit. Um, moths and butterflies um, are similar in the way that they pollinate, uh, but moths typically are out at night and butterflies during the day, but that's not exclusive. You'll find some day feeding moths as well. Usually they're a little more colorful, um, you know, brightly colored. Uh, they have very, um, complete uh, life cycle metamorphosis in their life cycle. They go from egg to larva to pupa to adult. And the reason you want to know this is that you need to host that larva in particular, which is a plant eating pest. 
And so we have a lot of plant-eating pests that we're trying to get after, like a butterfly called the imported cabbage worm butterfly. It's a white to sort of yellowish white, green sometimes butterfly, flits around all summer long here from April through October. I'm not seeing them now, so I think they've already stopped for the year. They can have multiple generations and they eat our broccoli and cabbage and kale and all those things. So you'll find these little green caterpillars on them. And so this is the case with anybody in this group is they need some food to eat for their young so that they can pupate and become an adult that then goes about the business of pollinating our flowers. So we have to put up with that. We have to know what they eat. Um, you can cater to it. You can add extra plants to the yard um, that they can have or tolerate some damage. They don't live very long, typically, although some can live up to 10 months. The bigger they are, usually the longer lived they are. They like white and flat flowers that they can land on easily, and they have good color vision. So what you're seeing in this photo is the flower on the left is what we see, that yellow flower, and the one on the right is their vision, where they're seeing these red, um, sort of bullseyes in the flowers that lead them to where the nectar is. So they're called nectar guides and they can zoom in on that and know where to find the nectar. When they're feeding, they're looking for nectar. Pollen will collect on their legs and their body and then they will move it around. And one of their benefits is they travel longer distances than bees do. So they will be all over the place. Next. So in um, the Northwest, we have about 20, 1,200 species of moths. Um, their wingspan can vary from tiny, one-tenth of an inch to six inches. The one on you see on the right, an elegant sheet moth, this is one I mentioned that's a day moth that's colorful. And this one looks odd here because it was just coming out of the, um, um, just out of pupation and it was, putting, uh, starting to expand its wings. And so it hasn't really unfolded completely into its adult form. And um, this was in a yard of a neighbor where I used to live in Northeast Seattle um, that um, took that picture and shared it with me. They're pretty interesting little critters. Um, one way you can tell them apart is the antenna uh, are different than a butterfly. They often are thickened. It could be flattened, it could be thread-like or feathery. Butterflies have knobs on the end of their antenna and moths do not. They also hold their uh, wings more close to the body. So you can see kind of not, you can see in the sand verbena moth that it's kind of tighter to the body rather than spread out like you would expect with like a swallowtail, for instance, butterfly. The San Verbena moth is one, um, a native moth in Washington state up in the San Juan Islands that is at risk because of habitat loss. So this particular plant, the San Verbena is um, this moth's plant. And with loss of that plant, then we lose that species of moth. Next. So butterflies, as I mentioned, you can see in these pictures pretty easily, the knobs on the end of the antenna. Um, these are, guys are colorful, their wings are sort of spread out more. If they're not, they're held upright behind their backs. Um, they hold them up, especially when warming up, you'll see them kind of move in and out of an upright and a spread out position. They need warmer temperatures to start flying, so 60 degrees at least. And often early in the morning, <clears throat> you'll see them sitting in plants, not moving, but doing that movement with their wings as the, as the sun is heating them up. Um, they're usually around from March until early October. Uh, they have um, a lot of camouflage potential in their wings. They can blend into things and they are also um, attractive uh, for their mates. And they can be plant species dependent as well. So one little butterfly called the Red Admiral, which I see in my yard, um, stinging nettle is really important to this butterfly. So somewhere in my neighborhood, and I live near um, Longfellow Creek, and I'm sure there's nettles somewhere in the neighborhood, uh, there are nettles around. And then of course the classic um, partnership is monarch and milkweed plants. 
Monarchs are not native to the Puget Sound Basin. You'll find them further south of Puget Sound, eastern Washington. They don't spend a lot of time on the ground here, but they do fly over and they go from, um, our population goes from uh, Central and South uh, California up to Southern California up to British Columbia. And so planting milkweed along the way with climate change and changes, you know, in um, phenology and things that are happening um, for and that are impacting insects, we can plant milkweed, which could be helpful in the long run. Uh, it'll also feed a lot of other insects. Um, and a lot of other butterflies. It's really a good pollinator plant. And there are some native milkweed species that you can use. And then there's the Puget Blue, which is a beautiful little blue, sort of iridescent blue butterfly in it, and it lupin is its flowers. So a lot of these species are at risk due to urbanization and habitat fragmentation because of that. And we lose species when we don't have corridors. So it's really important for us as uh, gardeners and you know people who want to make sure that we're protecting pollinators to create habitat gardens in our garden and our yard and you know encourage other people who live around us to do the same the more we all do it the more um, habitat we're building and the more we sort of mitigate that fragmentation that has happened from uh, native um, uh, gardens being native woodlands and prairies being um, taken apart. So next. All right, so here's some examples of swallowtails and monarchs, which are, are pretty um, representative of butterflies in the, in the sense of familiarity people know. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people haven't seen their larva, and so I want you to get a good look at them here. In this picture you see on the top, an adult swallowtail. And there are different <clears throat> varieties of swallowtail. There's um, tiger swallowtail, swallowtails and anise swallowtails. Um, this particular lar larva that you see on the right is on fennel, and that is an anise swallowtail, and they like this plant. And they are super colorful um, caterpillars and very big, and very, very um, noticeable. <clears throat> the bottom picture is the monarch, and a lot of times people get these confused, but you can see monarchs have a, a little bit different pattern, and they are really orange, much, much more orange. And then that's the larva of the monarch on a little milkweed seed seedling that we had planted in a garden. We planted these, and they came with uh, monarchs on them, um, the larva, and we put them out in the garden that way. The one that you see in the bottom picture, what if if you were to see the wings up, you would see a little tag on it. It was actually released by Washington State University, um, a group that was doing some release in Yakima and in Seattle and then tracking where they went. So they were watching their migration and tracking where they went down on the central coast in California. Okay, so next. Uh, now, this is the big group, the Hymenoptera. This is all the guys that we worry about, that we don't like, that we swat at, um, that we are afraid of. Um, I know I have lots of sugar ants that drive me crazy in my house, um, but these guys do a ton of pollination, and we're going to look at the different things that they do. So next. All right, so first I'm gonna start with the shining stars, the native bees. Um, and I wanna start here because these are the most important of all of them. These guys, there's many, many, many of them in, um, in the world, native bees. A lot of them are solitary. Um, they don't live in hives. Mason bees are one example of that. So, did we skip a slide? I feel like we jumped into something. Maybe not. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, so mason bees um, are called mason bees because they build a little mud wall that you can see in these pictures. So this close-up one under the, um, the name Osmia lignaria is a really good example of that. So what happens is the female bee will hatch out of this tube 
and go about the business of doing all the pollination of our fruit trees and anything else that might be blooming at the time of year she's out. And then she's going to go back to some sort of tube. And these are tubes that were created for them. So this is a you know manufactured tube in a little bee house that's intentional for them to nest back into. But they might find that in a crack in a tree, crack in a house wall. Um, could be a lot of things um, that they're, they're finding. Maybe a stem of a plant that's hollow. And they lay eggs, put a pollen sac next to it build this wall and they do that repetitively throughout the tube until they cap off the end and they use mud to do that. So these guys live in these little tubes for quite a few months. They're only active maybe February through June and often not coming out until March out of these tubes, March and April sometimes. So they're, they're early to come out, um, but they don't live very long. The male is laid at the end of the tube and is um, potentially being picked off by predators because they don't need as many males as females. The females do all the pollination work. So they come out, they mate, the females go around and collect pollen. They're extremely efficient. They can travel, travel 300 feet from their nest is all. So you need them close by to whatever you're pollinating, but they fly earlier in the spring in cooler, cloudier weather. Um, they come out earlier in the day and stay out later. And honeybees, by comparison, can't match that. And they're not out that early. So they're super important for our fruit trees. Six of these guys can pollinate a whole fruit tree in one day. So that's not much. You don't need very many of them. Okay, next. And then these are the summer equivalent of the mason bee and they're called leaf cutter bees and they do the exact same thing except in a different season and they use leaves like you can see in these pictures. So you will see damage on your plants from these guys because they cut little um, <clears throat> very round um, cuts in the leaf. You can see this one in action here. They're very meticulous <laughs> about it. They get this perfect little arc cut on your leaf. It doesn't look um, natural even. It looks like somebody took like a punch hole thing and, and clipped your leaf. And they take that leaf and they lay their eggs and they build their walls and they do the same thing. So they come out in the spring and the same thing will happen. They'll mate. The males will die soon after. They will go about the business of pollinating. They do the summer pollination. Um, <clears throat> they can nest in hollow stems. Very common to see these in hollow stems because, you know, if you think of things like sedum um, spectaboli, which is a tall sedum with the flowers that bloom in the fall, those have very hollow stems. And when they die back, if you're not too tidy and you leave some of those, they can be great nesting places for these guys. So um, you can raise them like mason bees. You can actually rent them. There's a company that rents both mason and leaf cutter bees to people and takes care of them, does all the cleaning of the cocoons, does all the things that need to happen to keep these guys healthy. Next. So there are a lot of different kinds of really interesting um, other native bees. We have sweat bees. Um, there are um, several different species of those, um, genus of those, Lazioglossum, Agapostamon, Helictus, but all of these guys look a little different from each other, but have similar behaviors. Their nesting is a little bit different, but most of them are solitary ground nesters. Uh, the Helictus, um, they can have a semi-social nest um, in, the, in the sense that the nests are connected, but they have their own nest within maybe a network underground. And uh, others have solitary nests and, you know, just disparate places around your property. So you want to know that because you don't want to be necessarily mulching over the top of them. You don't want to disturb them. Um, they can have a nest in rotting wood. It could just be down in the ground or in a dry bank in your garden. And um, some of them are double nesters, like the agapostamon, and then the helictus single nesting. So, you know, they're they're pretty. Um, they're not going to repeat 
uh, performance on nesting. So you need to take care of them and make sure that they're protected. These guys are generalists for flowers. Uh, they like pretty much anything that's blooming at the times when they're around. And these are generally more summer um, active. Um, they're called sweat bees because they will land on you. Um, they're looking to collect sweat off of skin. So next. The longhorn bee, it, longhorn bee is um, completely adorable, fuzzy bee. Uh, it's a soil burrower. It'll actually be down in the soil in a ground nest. Um, these are more like apartment complexes. So it's like uh, if you had a whole bunch of little bee condos underground. They're super hairy, carry a lot of pollen uh, on those hind legs. And they are really important uh, sunflower pollinators. So for farmers who are growing sunflowers, there are different species of these guys um, in different parts of the United States, and they're really important. You're gonna see them mostly spring and summer. Okay, next. These are my favorites, the bumblebees. There are 45 species in the United States. Um, there are multiple species in the Northwest. They have social and annual colonies, so they are um, social uh, nesting. Uh, bees like a honeybee. The queen lives over during the winter, so sometime this fall you may have seen a very large bee buzzing around all by itself, and uh, she's looking for a place to nest. Often that's a dry kind of slope, somewhere where it's not too wet. They nest underground. They could be in rat burrows. Sometimes they're in compost piles. I've had them in wood pile in my yard. I've had them in a bale of peat moss I used to have sitting outside my um, garage many, many years ago. Um, I have seen them in old birds' nests. I've seen them in um, bird houses that you put up in the uh, garden to attract chickadees and they'll come in and nest in them instead. Um, they could be in clumps of grass. So if you like a lot of uh, ornamental grasses in your yard that you, know, you wanna be watching for these guys there as well as those hollow stems for those other solitary bees. So they're all different colors. They're you know generally yellow and black, but they could have white, they could have orange. Um, there's some really cute and pretty ones and they have different seasons. So earlier in the spring, the species that you see will give way to a different one, to a different one. So you'll see different guys over the course of the summer. And uh, one of the more common ones we're, we're gonna look at here. One of the really important things um, that they do is something called buzz pollination. And what that is, is they vibrate the whole body and their wings when they get up into a, a flower. So they're really efficient in getting flowers that are hard to open and that don't release pollen easily to let go of their pollen. And their, their uh, buzz um, performance actually will work like a tuning fork with vibration and you can take a tuning fork and replicate what they do and it makes the pollen just pop out. You can actually find video of this online to look at, it's pretty fascinating. Super important pollinators for blueberries, tomatoes and peppers. Okay, next. So in um, some years ago, and they're not actively doing this project, you could probably still find material online about it. There was a project called the Urban Pollination Project, which was two graduate students at University of Washington. One was an entomologist, the other a botanist. And they wanted to identify who was pollinating tomatoes in the Seattle area. And so they used a lot of community gardens as their study space. And they did um, a project where they took you, they would give you the plants and you would have three tomato plants in your garden that were identical you know, varieties, and they would cover one of them in a, um, a sort of mesh cloth where you know, air and light and water could get through, and they would leave it alone, and you would do nothing to it, and they would cover one in a mesh cloth, but that one you get use of this tuning fork that each garden got to use, and you would take the tuning fork and actually um, use it to make that pollen fly out and pollinate each flower. And then the third one you left uncovered and let the bees and other insects get at it. And then they had uh, volunteers who would sit and watch who was visiting 
the, uh, the plant that didn't have the cover. And then they measured the quantity and weight of the tomatoes that were developed, developed from this process. In the end, they discovered that this bumblebee, the yellow-faced bumblebee, was the primo pollinator of tomato plants in the Seattle area. It's very commonly seen. You see it in, in mid to late summer. And um, of course, it was the best producer were the ones that were pollinated by bees. They still got fruit off the other ones, even the one they did nothing to, um, but it's just not as much production as when the bee is involved. So next, this bee used to be one of the most common in the Northwest, Bombus occidentalis. Um, the Western bumblebee has, you can see in this picture, its um, rear end, its hind is white in comparison to the yellow on its, um, on its head section. So it's super important um, if you see these guys, you know, to let somebody know because they don't, they're not sure how many of them are around. In 2013 and 2014, they saw a few, but they've been in, in um, pretty serious decline since the late 1990s. They are key pollinators for blueberries and cranberries. I'm sure they, you know, they found other solutions to this, but they're worried that part of what happened with these guys is that when commercially raised bumblebees were brought in to uh, help um, with pollination, and sometimes this happens in greenhouse settings, uh, they brought in fungi that, um, you know, then did a number on these guys. So there's um, disease issues that can happen with introduced species of insects. And then, of course, loss of habitat as well. There is one flower these guys like a lot. It's a little yellow flowered um, clover uh, family flower, Melissoides, and that one is you don't see it around very much. Melisotis, I think. Anyway, um, if you see these guys, let us know. You can call the garden hotline, let us know. Um, taking pictures of them would be cool. Thank you. And then next, um, there's other common ones. The black-tailed bumblebee had a ton of these on my rhododendron this spring. Uh, so rhododendron season time, these are really noticeable. They're kind of small, super cute, super fuzzy, and that bright orange on them. And then the fuzzy horn bumblebee, um, Bombus mixtus, you'll see these around too. I've seen a fair amount of these in my garden as well. Next. All right, honeybees are not native to the Northwest, but they are here and they do swarm. Um, you know, they, they will swarm away from whatever beekeepers keeping them. There's a very active beekeeping society um, in the Northwest. Um, folks raise them uh, for honey, obviously, and um, they do a tremendous job of pollinating all kinds of things. They have valuable commodities, you know, which are is different than some of the other bees that we um, think are important. Um, and they are huge. Their colonies are huge. One colony can house 10,000 bees, very social. There's been lots of studies about how they communicate with each other. Um, I have seen um, wild uh, swarms land in my sister's pear tree one year, and that was kind of fascinating. And by the time the beekeeper got there, they moved, moved on to a different spot. They finally did find them and where they went. Um, but they go out and collect them and put them back into an apiary. Um, one of the great things about these guys is they're out later in the growing season. So they will help pollinate things in your vegetable garden later than uh, other bees that are already sort of like the queen bumblebees are looking for places to overwinter and the honeybees are still active. However, in the Northwest, our native flora, it, we don't have a lot of fall bloomers, you know, that are native plants. And so it's important to supplement with things that are ornamental that will help to protect them. There's always been some contentiousness with the noxious weed group and the beekeepers because knotweed is one of those late blooming plants. It's really great for bees and great for honey. And, um, you know, but it's a really terrible noxious weed at the same time. So finding some sort of um, solution to that and bringing different plants in that can bloom in the fall can be helpful. So you need one to two hives that can cover the work that 250 mason bees can do. 
So that shows you the kind of industriousness of mason bees compared to a honeybee. Honeybees have a different purpose too. They're not looking, you know, they're looking um, to collect pollen for different reason. And they there are many more of them. So, you know, they that's that's the way they function by sheer number. There's a lot of concern about what colony collapse is all about. And there's lots of different theories you know, that you'll read about, but it's, it's most generally um, a combination of things, you know, pesticides, um, uh, habitat could, it could still affect these guys, even though they're not native, just because they don't have enough uh, material to collect pollen from, um, and potentially, you know, mites and diseases uh, that we know affect them. So next. So even flies, which we're always swatting at, are efficient pollinators, not as efficient as a bee, but they still do their part. Many of these are also plant pest predators. So for instance, the hoverfly that you see in that bottom picture, many people think this is a bee because it's striped. Um, flies have one pair of wings and they have those very large eyes. So if you get a close look and can really look, you can tell the difference. And a hoverfly, you'll know because it's going to sit in front of you and hover. It's not going to, you know, we talk about bee lines, make a bee line. That comes from the fact that bees are purposeful. They're moving from place to place, sort of in a straight line. A hoverfly kind of darts around and will come sit in front of you and sort of hover. And then you'll see it do that over flowers as well. Um, so some of them are good bee mimics too. This little bee fly. Um, that picture I took in our greenhouse down at the Rainier Beach farm, it was just sitting on the edge of a um, plant flat and um, just sat there for a while. It was warming itself up inside the greenhouse. Um, but it's a fly, not a bee, but it, you know, at first glance, it looked like a bee. Um, they like pale, dull, dark toned flowers. Um, they are attracted to plants that produce pollen. They like funnel like flowers. Um, and they're, you know, they're out busy doing things, even that green bottle fly, which is just sort of that fly that kind of lands everywhere all summer long. Okay, next. Even ants can pollinate. So there are some species of sedum that actually need, are ant pollinated. Um, typically, they're looking for nectar and they're gathering those pollen grains by accident. You know, ants love, a lot of them are collecting sugar. Many of them will farm aphids on plants so that they can get the sugary um, waste that comes from the aphid. Uh, the little sugar ants that come into your house are looking for water and sweet things. Um, so they love sweet stuff, but in the Northwest, sedum are ant pollinated and they typically are, are on plants that are low to the ground. Although, I have a few cacti in my kitchen window that they like to crawl around onto. I'm sure they're collecting something on there. Next, um, beetles. So there's so many beetles. There's lots and lots of different kinds of beetles, some of which are plant pests, and many of them are super efficient plant predators and, and can pollinate at the same time. So what we're looking at in the pictures are a soldier beetle, the orange one on the bottom, and then the lady beetle. And there's lots of different kinds of lady beetles. There's native ones. There's also ones that are introduced here to the Northwest. Um, there's um, an Asian uh, lady beetle that actually will um, nest in house, house siding and they can be a bit smelly. And if anybody's had that happen, they know what I'm talking about. They are attracted to tall, um, vertical walls that are white or sand colored because in their native environment, they nest in sort of sandy cliffs. Our native uh, lady beetles fly into the mountains, the low or, you know, the foothills of the mountains, and they nest together in big balls inside of, you know, open logs and they protect each other. They cluster up to protect each other. And then when they, when they wake up in the spring, they fly back to the lowlands. This is one reason why if you buy these guys to disperse in your yard as predators, they sometimes fly away because that's what they're bred to do when they woke up, wake up, that's their, their nature. And so they will um, 
they will wake up and then fly off to the neighbor's yard. Um, so if everybody's putting them out, that's helpful, but it's really better to attract them. So bringing in things that have um, lots of different fl flowers and shapes. Um, they like white, off-white, green flowers, um, bowl-shaped open flowers, things they can crawl around on easily, um, things that have clusters of small flowers. So there's lots of potential for, you know, things um, to collect and in insects. There could be lots of aphids on these things that they're after. Uh, things that aphids like, they will lay their eggs where aphids are, pre are present. Um, so lots of beetles and we really do want to encourage them. Next. So why are they declining? Well, I mentioned some things already, pesticide use, loss of habitat, insect and disease issues. All of these things affect them. And the more we can do you know, to help with that, we can affect the first two pretty heavily. We can build habitat. We cannot use pesticides in our garden. Even when you use oil and soap-based pesticides, which are certified organic products, they can kill pollinator and beneficial insect um, eggs, larvae, adults, if you spray them. Um, so they're vulnerable to the things that we do. Insect and disease issues, we can't do as much about, except if you build a healthy garden, um, you, you will have a lot of diversity. And sometimes with, with some diseases, you can mitigate that by having a lot of different, um, um, different things in the garden that can sometimes take care of a disease. So there's something else that takes care of that disease. Um, and it doesn't get as built up out of control and be able to decimate your population of insects. Next. So our role is to build habitat. Um, habitat is just an environment that's occupied by a particular species in the garden. And we're trying to cater to that. So if you are paying attention, the first thing I tell people to do is to really watch and see what's in your garden see who visits what. I could have three different kinds of plants sitting next to each other in my garden and they are going to have different um, different insects on them. So some insects like these open flowers like you see here which are in the carrot family and some of them like the daisy flower better and you will see sort of this diverse variety of insects depending on what you have growing. So next. These are the things you need to make sure you got going on. You need to have food for them. That could be flower nectar, could be fermenting fallen fruit. Um, it could be pollen. Um, you need to have specific plants that larvae can eat. So it could be the plant itself. They need to have some sort of shelter, whatever that means to them. It's gonna be different depending on the species. It's important to have canopy layers. Um, you know, the more diversity you have in size of plant and shape of plant in your garden, the more diverse your um, fauna will be. Snags and deadwood can provide, you know, important environments for a lot of insects and a lot of birds. Um, thickets can be helpful, especially for, if, even if you're just looking to bring songbirds in, which can be big insect eaters. Those guys need lots of places to get safe if there's, um, you know, other predators around. You can have those handmade shelters, like some of those bee houses, make sure there's some bare soil, Mulched areas are good. Black beetles love mulched areas. Um, create groups of plantings, you know, so that you're not just have individual single plants, but you have habitat. We're looking at trying to create three-dimensional, uh, diverse um, garden with plants and then sticks and mulch and rocks and dead, maybe even dead stems on things. And then water, super important. What you're looking at here too are more soldier beetles. Next. So here's some examples of the kind of habitat I'm talking about. The top right picture is really a bunch of insect hotels. Um, and some of those could even be meant for birds, but they're different shapes and sizes of entry holes. A leaf cutter bee and a mason bee need different dimension of the hole that they use, just like a chickadee would. Um, a robin is a platform nester versus a, a chickadee being a cavity nester. So knowing the differences, you need places that maybe spiders might want to live. 
or you know other critters. So you're you're catering to them. Um, sometimes some of those rock walls that you see in the background of that could be great places for bumblebees to nest. I've had bumblebees nest in rock walls before in places I've worked. Um, and then on the left, you're seeing cover crops growing. So cover crops build healthy soil, but they also will build this tremendous network of um, underground um, uh, mycelium and bacterial and other microorganism colonies. And all of that can be also helpful and food for some of the critters that we're trying to take care of. And then all those flowers that bloom in the flowering types of cover crops that we can grow are really important for spring pollinators. Bumblebees love that stuff. Um, you know, the diversity in the picture in the bottom left, that's just showing, you know, how you create and have Think about scale and different sized trees and shrubs and all the layers, deciduous, evergreen, different kinds of flowers. And then on the right is an example of a red flowering current, which is really super important for Anna's hummingbirds in the spring in the Northwest. So next. Um, you know, we are wanting to garden. We want to put in plants. So we are lucky that many of the things that we are already gardening with that we love and grow for other reasons are great pollinator plants. Some of the principles you can use to enhance your garden are to plant in groups so you have more efficiency. So they don't have to move as far. They don't have to go from this flower that's here over to the other one that's six feet away, but they go to the one that's right next to it to right next to it. Put them around, if you're trying to grow vegetables, put them around your flowering plants that need your know, fruiting tomatoes and peppers that you're trying to get fruit on because they will find them more easily. Use diversity, again, color, fragrance, shape, height, seasonality. When are they blooming? Keep that season going as long as you can. Like I said, I have that rosemary blooming now. So it's gone, I'm going into winter with something in, the, in bloom already. Uh, Weeds can be a good source. I actually have dandelions along the front of my fence in my front yard. It's right on the sidewalk. There's just a little rock, a gap with some rock in it. And I let them bloom and then cut them down later and don't let them go to seed. Um, but they've come up every year and bloom and they're great for dandelion or for bumblebees. Um, make sure you're planting for larvae. You need to make sure caterpillars are food. And then know which three big families are important. Um, uh, the carrot family, the mint family, the daisy family, lots of native plants in these groups. So catering to native uh, species is important to put native plants, but also there's tons of plants in those families that are really important. Um, the carrot family is a lot of herbs like fennel and cilantro and uh, dill, things like that, lovage. Um, Sweet Sicily, there's a ton of things. Lamiaceae or the mint family, this is all of the Mediterranean herbs we grow like lavender and rosemary and mint and sage and oregano and marjoram and thyme. And the Asteraceae is all the daisies, all the flowers that we grow to cut, you know, marigolds and calendula and cosmos and sunflowers and asters and, you know, that goes on and on. So we're growing these things anyway. So make use of them, get them really spread across your yard and make sure you have a long um, blooming period for all those. So next. Here are some examples. And these are all pictures I took over time. Um, I think this, yeah, I think this guy plays, uh, Marcy, if you wanna try and play it, if we have a minute. So that's a bee on a zinnia. So zinnias again in the in the daisy family. Dandelions in the daisy family. Um, that's one of the weeds. Um, yarrow, chicory, burdock. There's so many dahlias. Okay, next. Um, this is the mint family again. Oh, Monarda is another one. So Monarda is that bee balm, that lovely plant. And what you're seeing here, if you look closely, you can just see there's just things moving everywhere. And what you see on the on the um, mint family plants is going to be different than what you see on the 
parrot family plants. So they could be right next to each other. That was one of those imported cabbage worm butterflies I mentioned, also a pollinator, but also trying to lay eggs on your broccoli. Um, but these guys are great. I have tons of these in my yard. They're very busy on these guys. Okay, next. And then here's the carrot family. So there's a ton of things. These are soldier beetles on carrot flowers. In the UK, they call them bonking beetles because they are usually, you see them mating a lot like this, um, but they are moving around and um, they're looking for insects, um, doing their job. And so as they move through the flower, they're moving all that pollen around too. But these are all examples of things in that family. Um, really beautiful. There are some poisonous plants in this family you should be aware of. So things like giant hogweed and the um, poison hemlock are both in this family. And those are very dangerous plants. The rest of these are really useful, tasty, and beautiful plants. You can even let a carrot winter over and it'll bloom next year. And it has this fantastic flower that attracts all these guys. They're very attractive to the parasitoid wasp, which is um, a egg, has an egg laying device that goes into aphids, lays eggs in aphids, and then they eat them from the inside out and kills all the aphids on your plant for you. So next. And then here's an example of hummingbird plants. This is the back of my house and this little hummer. I have a lot of things. She would go to all the different things that are in the garden too. So I had honeysuckle earlier and there was Monarda and Snapdragon and Sedum and she's gonna <laughs> come see what I'm doing. Um, but there's so many beautiful plants, you know, we're growing these anyway. So put them out judiciously, pay attention to what the, your, your um, critters are looking at and interested in and, and capitalize on that and put more of them in. Okay, next. So you need to make sure you have things they can use to nest. So I mentioned a lot of these already. So bumblebees, you know, even an upside down flower pot, you could put clay pots in around the garden and see if somebody uses them. Um, sometimes we've actually created rock piles places um, on purpose um, and just left them alone so that they can be used. Lots of different um, places. You know, you wanna be careful about um, you know, rotting wood around your property, but they do, many things do like soft dead wood, um, but stems that have pith, even blackberry, um, red, um, red, um, red, um, not current, um, oh, I just forgot, elderberry. So elderberries have that pithy wood and they, they're great for bees that wanna nest in tubes. Um, Mason bees are gonna be around. I have them in my yard and I don't raise them. So I see them every spring anyway. Um, you need a lot of leaf litter and ground cover for beetles. In some farms they create things called beetle banks, which are long, in between the row crops, they put a row of native grasses and that creates a home for beetles. And then they scurry out around to feed at night and eat the slugs and slug eggs. Um, and then native shrubs, making sure you have native shrubs that the larva can eat for moths and butterflies. So things like willow can be really important for them. Um, and then moss, a lot of people call the hotline to worry about moss in the lawn and say, what do I do? And, you know, we talk them through why it's there and how to deal with that. But we also impress upon people that moss is a plant material that a lot of birds use for nesting. So this is a chickadee nest. Um, that is a box nest that um, a picture was taken of the nest inside, lots of moss in there. Hummingbirds make their nests from um, lichen, moss, and spider silk. So pretty enchanting and we need to have it in the yard or they won't be able to use it. Next. Um, and then I added these on request for you guys. So um, I hear that you're hoping to have a campaign in May for no mowing. And what this is really referring to is thinking about giving your lawn a little bit of time um, to, to grow um, in order for this to be really um, useful and helpful for pollinators. Uh, it it's good to have flowers in the lawn. So, 
there are two percent of our of our ground in the United States is covered by lawn. It's a lot. Lawns are intensively managed. Uh, lots of chemical inputs. People are putting on things to kill weeds, to kill moss, <clears throat> to kill um, grubs in the lawn, to um, fertilize the lawn, and they're using chemicals to do this. And a lot of times we're removing everything. You mow the lawn and you take the grass clippings away and start leaving them in place. So we're not managing a natural system in a lawn at all, but you can. You can change that habit. You can grass cycle. You can put flowers in the lawn. Um, and spring, as I mentioned, I have those dandelions out front and that's not a lawn area, but it's a, a little edge of a sidewalk and I let the dandelions bloom on purpose. We have a pollinator hillside garden at the, our Rainier Beach farm site and we have dandelions planted in there on purpose and we just weed them out where we don't want them and leave big huge clumps of them for springtime bloom. Um, you could put lots of other stuff in too, which we'll talk about in two seconds, but you can let the lawn grow during May and that any slowing down of mowing can allow grass to grow and flowers to bloom and will encourage and support pollinators. Um, ground nesting bees, if they're in your lawn and sometimes people have them, they also can be at risk. So even if there's no flowers in your lawn, you wanna know who lives in your garden and where because if they're in your lawn, you wanna give them a little bit of a break. So you can do this even just by mowing once that month if you have to. But basically the idea is to just sort of take a break and let nature be. And then, um, you know, you're gonna help the process. And so in the next slide, next is alternatives. What else could you do? So a lot of my clients over the years, you know, I had my own uh, work uh, that I did for many years and I would add flowers to people's lawns and we would do this in traditional lawns. So what I mean by a traditional lawn is it's lawn grasses and lawn grasses, the species that they use grow tall on purpose. You have to mow them a lot because of that, but those are the kinds of grasses they are. And the reason you use those is they grow really fast and they grow really well and thick and you know they make a beautiful green lawn but you can add things like Dutch clover, you can add daisies, crocus, yarrow. I've done all of this and it looks great and it works really well and they behave well together. So I don't put dandelions into lawns because I know that that's a little more disruptive and it bothers people more. It also, dandelions tend to colonize a little bit more, but you could, they still can work. The mowing um, practice for the three, besides the crocus, which you have to, again, let, let be for a minute uh, to let it bloom. But the other three all um, take mowing really well. And yarrow is a big, tall perennial, but when you put it in a lawn setting, it will start to just sort of creep into the lawn and makes these really kind of ferny little leaves. The benefit of clover is it adds nitrogen to the lawn just because it's a pea family plant and it stays green during the summer. So all of these make your lawn more um, um, water, um, water, need less water, I should say. They need less fertilizer and they don't need as much mowing, um, especially if you convert the grasses to native grasses. So native grasses are shorter. They don't need to be mown as, mown as often. So you can either just use what you already have or you can start adding lawn grasses, other kinds of grasses that are native grasses and start to convert over. Um, but it can look quite beautiful and be really useful to pollinators. So next. This is, I think, the last little video. Um, this is just an example of a bumblebee queen looking for a nest. She was trying to see if there was a spot there. Um, Typically, she would be fully under, you know, try to get fully underground, but you can see how big and fat she is. That is a big bumblebee. Those are the queens. Um, and this was in the fall. She was trying to find a spot. She takes a little bit of a break. And I think she tries again, but I don't know that she ever succeeded. This video was sent to me by a friend of mine who used to work with us on the hotline.
but that's an example of sort of an area where they might be looking. Uh, they're looking for places that are going to stay dry during the winter and not, um, you know, not get washed out. So next, this is uh, one of my favorite books. So these are some resources for you. Um, this book, Attracting Native Pollinators, is put out by the Xerces Society. Um, if you ever take a class from them, you know, you pay the fee to go to the class, you usually get this book. They have another one that's about beneficial insects, too, that's excellent. They have a lot of case studies of places where, and they work with a lot of farmers and land, you know, big landowners, and, and they have a lot of case studies of where people are doing these really interesting things to protect pollinators and beneficial insects. Um, and they have a ton of information online, lots of different resources, lots of great plant lists. Uh, the Butterflies of Cascadia is also a really nice book. Um, looking for ones that are really specific to the Northwest, these books, you know, have Northwest species in mind. Uh, the USDA, U.S. Forest Service has some great lists too, and you just have to sort of figure out your region, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, and then that guide there, the Regional Guide and Plant List, Pacific Lowlands, um, is really ideal for the Northwest, really shows you um, what's going on here. And the Pollinator Partnership is, you know, across the country, but they have some great guides as well. Um, and then, of course, the Garden Hotline. We are your free service to call and ask questions about this stuff. Um, we can help you maybe find where plants are and suggest nurseries and um, other books, other websites. And we love also people sharing um, like your stories, you know, like tell us and, and, you know, teach us what you know, because like that video I got from my friend Fala, I didn't take that video, but I like to share and see what other people know and are up to. It's super helpful. Thank you so much, Laura. I just, I'm very aware of the time. I know we're over eight o'clock, so I just want to make some time. If anybody has any questions about anything Laura shared, feel free to drop them in the chat or take yourself off of Zoom and um, we'll we'll stay, keep the line open for a bit just to answer any questions. Is there anything from any of our backyard gardeners that are on the line? And as an FYI, the slides with the resources will be in Thursday's MailChimp. So we'll send all those out to you all. I'm also going to drop off some seeds for you guys, flower okay. seeds. Um, so you will have some seed packets. They will be for primarily for next year. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing that, Laura. We really appreciate that. Okay, everyone. I look. It looks like Laura answered all of our questions. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna send you off for the evening. Laura, thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. It was an incredibly informative discussion, uh, presentation of all this material. Um, I'm sure it will um, lead to beautiful flourishing in all of our backyards. Thank you for this. You're welcome. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.